Well, hello church, if you would, uh, open up to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians 2, uh, we will look at the, verse, the first 10 verses here. That will be our focus tonight. Ephesians 2, this is God's Word starting in verse 1. It says, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived, and the passions of our flesh carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. And raised us up with Him and seated us with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages, He might show the immeasurable riches of His grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not of your own doing. It is a gift of God. Not a result of works. So that no one may boast. For we are His workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus for good works. Which God prepared beforehand. That we should walk in them. And so Father we pray that this theological truth of sola grate, grace alone, would translate into those good works overflowing out of our lives. Lord, You created us in Christ Jesus for those good works. You've predestined us for good works. You've prepared many good works. Not just to be done in this building, but to be done in our homes and workplaces all around this city. And so, Father, we pray that the grace of Your Son, Jesus Christ, would liberate us tonight. So much so that it spills over in a life of love and good works. Lord, we pray You'd be honored in that. And we pray, Holy Spirit, that You would come and You would be the helper and the teacher and the one who enables all of this to happen. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, Well, if you are new, uh, let me remind you we're continuing a series. We're in week four of five weeks in a series on foundations uh, of Reformed theology. uh, Foundations of Reformed theology. And we're studying the five solas of the Reformation uh, is what we've been studying these last few weeks. And um, I, I want to just say from the, from, from the beginning here that we're, we're going to study this passage that I just read, but I also want to put this passage in a historical context, uh, namely in the Reformation. And so this is going to be a little more historical in terms of how we, we come at this than a, a sermon might typically be. Um, I, I want you to maybe try to imagine right now uh, going to church every week, your whole life, and not being able to understand anything that is being said. Because it's all in Latin. And you don't know Latin. Imagine that. I mean, that was hundreds and hundreds of years, millions of people before the Reformation. Uh, this was a revolutionary, uh, it, it literally changed the world when in the Reformation, they began to translate the Scriptures from Latin into German and into English so that the Scots and the British uh, and and, uh, parts of England are beginning to get the Bible in their own language. So now they're coming to church and they're actually understanding the Scriptures. They're actually reading it in their homes. You can imagine what what revival broke out uh, in this time. This was, you know, they were using, you, you say, even the imagine, even the, the priests that would stand before the people, these church leaders, uh, we'll call them, uh, they didn't even know the Scriptures. 
they're using a Latin a liturgical rite called the use of sacrum. And they're just going through this Latin liturgy, and they didn't know what they were saying. It was common for the priests to have many, many children from many women out of wedlock. This was a very, very dark and evil time. And um, even to begin to question these things, number one, you wouldn't have had much of a basis to question it since they didn't have the Bible. But even if you would have questioned it, you were not only questioning the church, you were questioning the state. Because the church and the state were one. And so to question the church was to question the state, and there would be steep penalties for that. And, and you say, well, how long was it like that? All the way back to uh, the 4th century in, when Constantine. All the way up to the Reformation. We're talking 900 years of a, of a state-church oneness uh, that was detrimental to people's faith and that brought just an amazing amount of wickedness. And, and there were certainly a, a remnant within that. And, and, and don't want to forget that, but also don't want to make light of how evil and, and dark this time was. Um, additionally, there was other bad things happening in the world, um, like uh, 1348 was the initial outbreak of the bubonic plague. That's at the, the end of the, um, the Middle Ages there. It's, it killed uh, in its scope one uh, third of Europe. I mean, imagine going into, there were cities that you would go into and 50% to 70% of the city would, would, was killed by the bubonic plague. I mean, imagine Pensacola, 50% of the citizens going to pace, 70% of pace. I mean, this is, this is, was happening, and then, and, and then this had, there were cycles of this that continued. In 1527, there was another outbreak in uh, Wittenberg, uh, where Luther was, and he and his wife decided, we're going to stay, and we're going to make our house a hospital for the sick. And they began to, to invite people in, and Luther wrote a letter to a pastor friend and gave some, him some advice on how to handle this plague, and he said this, a Christian never stops serving Christ. Those who are responsible for the spiritual and physical well-being of others must not flee an outbreak, but rather stay and care for the people in the midst of it. He said, if a deadly epidemic strikes, we should stay where we are, make our preparations, so he's not talking about some sort of foolishness, do everything you can to be safe, and take courage in the fact that we are mutually bound together. We cannot desert one another or flee from one another. And then he offers this perspective first we can be sure that God's punishment has come upon us. Not only to chastise us for our sins, but also to test our faith in love. And our faith that we would see how to act toward God and our neighbor. And so I bring this up because it is a little bit uh, providential, maybe we could say, the fact that we are going through uh, something not quite that severe. Um, but still trying to reform the church, and, and we have these uh, unique challenges ourselves. And I, I just want to put that before us and say, this is our heritage. When we're, when we're studying the Reformation, you need to see these as brothers and sisters in Christ who know many of the same struggles as us, only more so. And they kept their hand to the plow, and they risked much, and they suffered much to advance the gospel. And that we have a, a high, high bar that has been set for us. And what these reformers did to preserve and protect the church and to purify Christ's bride. We're very indebted to them. And you say, well, why did they take this so seriously? Well, these five solas of the Reformation, they saw as nothing more than the plain gospel of Jesus Christ. These are not five little doctrinal points. There's some kind of ivory tower theology. This is the gospel. The five solas sum up the gospel and what is essential to the gospel. And this is how Owen Strachan uh, in his book, uh, Sola, how the five solas are still reforming the church. He says this, the solas are not peripheral matters positioned to entangle us in the needless territorial doctrinal squibbles. Rather, they are the essence of the gospel. When we embrace them, we embrace the gospel. When we are, are, uh, 
when we speak them, we speak the gospel. When we live consciously of them, we live in the power of the gospel. And so that is true of all five solas. And I would say especially these last three pillars of the Reformation. Faith alone, grace alone, and Christ alone. And that word alone is the word sola. And that, that is, I've said this before, but this is the significant word, and you could say the whole Reformation really hinges on this word sola. Because uh, the Roman Catholic Church at that time, if you would have asked someone, is faith necessary for salvation? Is grace necessary for salvation? Is Christ necessary for salvation? They would have said yes. So you say, well, what's the difference? The word alone. They didn't believe Christ alone was enough, or that faith alone was enough, or that grace alone was enough. But you had to add your own works. You had to go to Mass. You had to take uh, the, the supper, which infused to you through those elements the very body and blood of Christ. The baptism is what saved you, right? You needed to add these things. Christ and Christ alone was not enough. And so... Uh, the whole Reformation really comes back to that word alone. And if you lose that word alone, you lose the gospel. We're not talking about small things here when we talk about the solas of the Reformation. So let's, uh, let's get into this fourth sola, sola grate, uh, which is grace alone. And Ephesians 2, if, it, you know, if we had to nail down maybe the most important passage to teach this doctrine, it would be Ephesians 2, in my opinion. Uh, so we'll, we'll focus in, and, and maybe even the more narrow verse we could look at, this is really what we're going to meditate on, is verse 5, this little phrase, by grace you have been saved. By grace you have been saved. What does that mean? We're going to meditate on that. And let me ask, a, maybe we, we should back up and ask a question here, what is Grace. What is grace? Grace is, uh, a very short, succinct definition would be, it's unmerited favor. Uh, the catechisms we teach our kids say grace is the unmerited favor of God. And then to, to explain this, I'll say to my kids, grace is when you do something bad and deserve to be punished, but instead uh, you get something good and you're not punished. That's grace. J.I. Packer said it like this, the grace of God is love freely shown toward guilty sinners apart from their merit and in spite of their defiance. It is God showing His goodness to persons who only should expect His wrath. And so, I want to put a few questions before us. And here's the first one I want to ask. I think these will be on the screen. Question one, and this is a, maybe a weird question, but it will make sense as I go through this. Why can't we understand grace alone until we've understood sin? Because I don't think we can. I, I don't think we can understand what the Reformers meant or what the Bible means about grace alone until we first get a good, solid, biblical definition of sin, which is what Paul does in verse 1 and following. He says, you were dead in your trespasses and sins. In which you want to walk, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived, in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. So God's grace. Uh, is not displayed against the backdrop of our pretty good, happy, quasi-religious life. It's, it's positioned to be against the backdrop of our utter depravity. That's the only way you can see the light of the grace is against the black backdrop of sin. And this is how the whole Bible is laid out. So you go back to the beginning and you see, how did, a, how did Israel become a nation that God favored? Did they do anything to earn this? Did they do anything to deserve it? Why Israel? Why not the Amalekites or, or, or the, the Hittites? Why not Babylon? Why not Egypt? Why, why Israel? 
And, and God said through the prophets numerous times why he chose Israel. He says, I chose you because I chose you. I chose to love you because I chose to love you. It was an act of grace. And then we see individuals like the pagan worshiping Abraham or Moses who murdered a man. It says that these men found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Why were they believers? Why were they men of faith? Because God was gracious to them. Noah is, a, is an excellent example. Um, a few weeks ago, we were, I think three weeks ago, we were at the, uh, the Ark Encounter is what it's called out in Kentucky. Uh, some of you have been there. And, um, you know, they have a replica. They use the actual dimensions in Scripture to rebuild a replica of the Ark. And you can walk around in it. It's massive and, and uh, quite sobering. And um, it's very sobering because you think eight people survived this global flood that killed all of humanity. And eight people made it through in this boat. And you think, well, how many people were in the world at that time? And a lot of people think it was maybe a few thousand or something. Uh, if there was a 1.2 growth rate, it would have been 147 million people that were on the earth at that time. If it was a 1.3 growth rate, it would have been 4 billion people. If it was a 1.4% growth rate, it would have been 19 billion people. Billion people who were on the earth during the flood. This was... Uh, easily, even with the most conservative numbers, more people than are alive today that were killed in the flood. You say, how is that even possible? Well, because people were living 700, 800, 900 years. I mean, how many children can you have in 900 years? And people had a lot more children back then also. Right? So the, even the most conservative estimates was there were, there were millions, possibly billions of people that died in the flood in eight people lived. And those eight people lived, how? Sola grate. Grace alone. Noah was a sinner like everybody else. God chose to save he and his family. By, or we could say through faith. By grace, through faith. He believed the promise. He built the ark. He got in and he made it through the flood. And so anyway, we're walking through this flood or uh, through this ark the other day, and it got more real for me, is after we come out, uh, there's this little playground, and they had a zip line, and the kids were playing, our kids were playing on that, and I'm standing there uh, watching our kids, and this young man, he was 15 years old, comes up to me, and, uh, and in the background, you know, I'm looking at him here, and in the background, you have this massive ark, so this is the setting for this conversation I'm about to have, this, this guy starts con just confessing all of his sins to me. He didn't know I'm a pastor. He doesn't know anything about me. Just starts saying, yeah, I've done this, I've done this, and uh, this happened to me. And he's just going through this laundry list of sins. And at, at one point, I mean, I don't know if this stuff happens to y'all. It doesn't happen to me often, but um, I just said, that sounds, sounds like you're in trouble. Because you, you're going to stand before God, and you've just seen He's a God of justice. And how are you going to do that? And I began to try and share with him the gospel. And this young man, unfortunately, he had no interest whatsoever. He, was, he, he could care less what I was saying. You would have thought I was offering him some food he didn't like. I mean, he, he didn't care. It wasn't important. And just the, the tragic irony of talking to someone outside of this massive boat that is a sign of God's judgment and grace and, and, and then just this apathy and indifference that I don't even care that God's going to judge sin. I don't need His grace. And, and this is what Noah dealt with. And, this is, and, I, and I bring that up to say this is what Paul's describing when he says dead in their trespasses and sins. That's what spiritual deadness is. You don't care. You don't, you don't even care. And, and so the reformers would ask this question, how dead is dead? What does it mean to be dead? When it says dead in trespasses and sins, how dead is dead? I mean, think about Lazarus. When Jesus comes to the tomb, was Lazarus 99% dead and he had 1% life? He was able to kind of walk himself out of there? 
Or, or was he completely dead and the voice of God raised him up? How dead is dead? It says we were dead, verse 5. We were dead in our trespasses and sins, but God made us alive. You say, I I thought that I received Jesus when I believed the gospel. I thought I received Jesus and then I came to life. No, it's the opposite. You came to life and then you believed and received Christ. That is the order that it lays out for us here. This is why the reformers would, uh, they, they called salvation monergistic, meaning God does it all as opposed to uh, Catholicism and what others were teaching at that time, that salvation was synergistic, that man was working with God to save himself. And, you know, a really famous illustration, I've given this before, is you have a man drowning in water. And uh, he's, he's drowning, and, and some would say that salvation is that God reaches down uh, to, to, to grab that man who's drowning in the water, and then that man reaches up and they grasp hands and the Lord pulls him out of the water and he saves him. And they would say that's a picture of salvation. But would it not be more accurate to say that a a, a picture of salvation according to this passage is that God sees our lifeless, spiritually lifeless corpse floating around at the bottom of the ocean and he reaches down and pulls our lifeless corpse up and breathes life into us and that's a picture of salvation. That's why Martin Lloyd-Jones said about this passage, he said the two greatest words in the Bible are, but God. Look at verse 4. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. You say, what is that called? Grace. By grace you have been saved. And then, We see it again. And raised us up with Him. And seated us with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So that in the coming ages He might show the immeasurable riches of His grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. So, that's the first thing it means to be saved by grace. Is that you're spiritually resurrected. You're spiritually made alive from death. And that order, I would argue, matters. Because it's here in the text, you have spiritual life. We were dead in our trespasses and sins, made alive together with Christ. Verse, uh, what verse is that? Verse 5. And then it says, faith. For by grace you have been saved through faith. So notice how that reads in verse 8. We were saved by what? Grace through faith. So grace saves us as it's working through faith. So faith is the necessary response to God's saving grace. Now, don't hear that and misunderstand what I'm saying about faith. Faith is a decision, a volitional decision of the will to choose Christ. But I'm saying that only happens when you've been spiritually resurrected. To have the ability to choose Christ. And that's the order in which Paul is putting this here. Which leads to uh, the second question. Um, The second question is, what what are the objections to being saved by grace alone? So these are objections that were back in the Reformation. These are objections that are popular now. Uh, The first one is this. If you preach salvation by grace through faith like this, then people will abuse it and they'll keep living wicked. And I would say that the the problem with this objection is it doesn't understand the power of conversion, which this passage is very clear on. Look back at verse 5. It says, We were made alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with Him and seated us in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That's not talking about in the future when you go to heaven. It's talking about at the moment of salvation. You were raised up with Him so that you can't keep living how you were before Christ. And this is confirmed in 1 John 3.9 that says no one born of God 
makes a practice of sinning for God's seed abides in him and he cannot keep on sinning because he's been born of God. By this it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. So Christians aren't sinless, certainly not, but we also are not the same as we were before we were resurrected and born again and given life. It changes us. And this leads to another objection that people often have. They would say, if you teach salvation is all of grace, then people will ignore God's commands or they'll, uh, they won't devote themselves to good works. But again, that's to not pay attention, I, I think, to this passage, which is, look at verse 10. It says, we are His workmanship, created, or you could say recreated, in Christ Jesus for what? For good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So if we do not uh, get resurrected to life, then believe upon Christ, and then that follow it in a life of good works, then God is not telling the truth in this passage. He says that these good works are prepared for us, who are recreated in Christ, so that if someone is His, they will begin to devote their life to good works. This is confirmed many places. I'll, I'll, I'll just point us to one passage. Titus 2.11 says this. Listen to the, I'm, I'm pointing out the connection between grace and good works. It says this. The grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives. What trains us to live godly lives, self-controlled lives? The grace of God. And then it goes on, awaiting for the blessed hope, the appearing of, our, our, of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from lawlessness, and listen, to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. What makes someone zealous for good works? He said, it's the grace of God that makes someone zealous for good works. And so listen, when we say grace alone, what we're not saying is that grace is alone and that it isn't followed by good works. When someone receives grace, good works follow in their life. That's what it says, by grace you have been saved, and then it says we've been created in Christ Jesus for good works. Here's another passage, 2 Corinthians 9, 8, God is able to make all grace abound to you so that you may abound in every good work. The grace abounds, the good works abound. Now, again, I'm, uh, this is the objection I'm answering here, and Paul pr brings this up in Romans. Listen to how Paul addresses this exact objection in Romans 6, 1. He says, are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? So people were accusing Paul of the same thing. They were saying, Paul, if you preach grace alone like this, people are going to just go off in sin. If you're, if, because we're, what, when we say grace alone, we're talking grace gets you saved. Grace keeps you saved. All the way to the end. And it's irresistible to the point that you can't resist it when He comes for you to save you. You can't stiff arm the Lord. He will take you down and save you and He will keep you saved to the end. That's what we mean by grace alone. And people said to Paul and say to us and said to the Reformers, well, if you preach that, people are going to go and live wickedly and they're not going to devote themselves to good works. And Paul says, no way. He says, by no means. Will it work like that? And then he says right after that, here's why. Because our old self, this is verse 6 of Romans 6, our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For the one who has died has been set free from sin. So he's arguing to the degree in which you've been liberated by the grace of God, you will be set free from sin to then devote your life to, to love and good works. 
And then he says it in verse 14, for sin will have no dominion over you since you were not under the law, but under grace. And again, to put this back in our context historically, where these debates were happening a lot in the Reformation, uh, there was a man named Erasmus who was arguing for free will against the reformers. And he would say, if you teach this type of free grace, then people are not going to be devoted to good works. And they're going to live wickedly and they're going to go off and they're going to abuse this grace. And Luther and the other reformers were saying, no, 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 no. You just, you're not understanding the power of conversion. You're not understanding what happens when someone is truly converted. God promises that good works will follow. And it, listen, and then they would quote this passage, Romans 6, 17. This is the same argument I was just given of Paul's. They will quote this. You were once slaves of sin and have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching in which you were committed. Obedient from the heart is what the grace of God does to us. And guys, this is a 900 year debate. When it hit the Reformation and they begin to debate this issue in the Reformation, that was 900 years after the debate first started happening by Augustine and Pelagius. So Augustine's defending the position that I'm preaching right now, grace alone, saying we're saved by grace alone. And then Pelagius goes, no, 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 it's grace plus works. And now the Reformation comes and it's new people, but they're having the same debate. And now you've got Jacob Arminius, where we get Arminianism. He taught God's grace is provisional so that salvation is a cooperative or synergistic act that man must use his free will to choose Christ. And Christ has then has, uh, activated the grace of God, but he must avail himself of that with his choice. Luther and the reformer said, yes, uh, he must choose Christ, but that is only when God liberates his will or makes his will alive and makes his will inclined to choose Christ. And they would say, because the will is not free. It is in bondage. And that's Luther's great contribution. The greatest book, if you want to read a Luther book, he wrote a book called The Bondage of the Will. And, um, and it's very helpful. And let me just say, you know, this is not about just uh, Luther or Calvin. There's many, many uh, reformers who were teaching uh, these things as they began to read the Bible for themselves for the first time. They were seeing all of this. And they wrote a, a very important confession called the Savoy Declaration. Uh, this was written in 1658. And on the chapter on uh, free will, I want to read that to you. Because when I throw out the word, that's a loaded word in many contexts. Free will. Whoa, what do you mean by that? they actually uh, entered into this debate and gave some helpful clarity. They said, we believe in free will. The Bible teaches free will. In the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve had free will in the Garden. But after the fall, the will is no longer free. It is now in bondage. And it must be liberated and acted upon by the Holy Spirit to then be able to exercise faith and to choose Christ and so they got into this debate, but let me, let me just read what they said here. They said, man by his fall uh, fell into a state of sin and has completely lost all ability of will to any spiritual good accompanying salvation. So as natural man being altogether averse from that good and dead in sin is not able by his own strength to convert himself or to prepare himself for salvation. When God converts a sinner and translates him into a state of grace, he frees him from his natural bondage under sin and by, his, and by grace alone enables him to freely will and to do that which is spiritually good, namely receive Christ by faith. Okay, so there's a lot of people, a lot of reformers who are teaching uh, this, this grace. And, and some of the writers of this, uh, you'll remember names like John Owen, uh, Thomas Goodwin, uh, they were both congregational ministers, this is a little Baptist history for us. Uh, they helped write this, this uh, confession. And this confession is built off of the first Baptist confession, which is the first London uh, confession in 
uh, in 1644, uh, was the first one, and then they wrote this one afterward, which, by the way, you can tell this to your Presbyterian friends, if you ever have a fun little debate on this, uh, the, the first Reformed Baptist confession was uh, two years before the first Presbyterian uh, confession. But here's what the first Baptist confession says. It says, all the elect being loved by God with an everlasting love are redeemed, quickened, and saved, not by themselves, nor by their works, lest any man should boast but only and wholly by God, of His own free grace and mercy through Jesus Christ, who is made unto us by God wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, redemption, and all in all, that he that rejoices might rejoice in the Lord. And so all of these early Baptist confessions were reformed in the sense that they taught grace alone, not works. And and I would I would just say they were just simply good students of Ephesians. I mean, they're just seeing that Ephesians, the whole book, you could say the main theme of Ephesians is grace. And, and it starts that way. Paul says, grace to you. And then at the very end, uh, he says, grace be with you. And then all through the book, we see the, the past grace, the present grace, the future grace. And the whole book is about the grace of God. In fact, um, I would challenge you to read Ephesians this week, and just look for that word grace, and study, maybe we can do that in city group, Uh, just just think through the grace of God laid out here, and I think what we'll see is this third question being answered, and this is our last question, why does grace alone matter? Why does grace alone matter? And if you'll go back to Ephesians 1, verse 4, it says this, Paul says, He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before Him. In love, He predestined us for adoption to Himself as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of His will. Here it is. To the praise of His glorious grace which He has blessed us in the Beloved. In Him, we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of His grace, which He lavished on us. So why did God save us by grace? Uh, To magnify the glory of His grace. In fact, that's why the universe exists. He could have just created, or not created, and displayed His glory, but He wanted to display the glory of His grace. So He made people and He allowed a fall and then He redeemed those people through His Son to display the glory of His grace. Um, Last night I was thinking about this and just trying to believe it. (laughs) Um, And I was on my uh, bike in our garage and uh, I was thinking over Isaiah 30 that says, the Lord waits to be gracious to you. And He exalts Himself to show mercy to you. He waits to be gracious to you. And listen, He exalts Himself to show mercy to you. We're not just talking about these ethereal theological things here. The God of all creation is exalted by giving grace to you. Do you know anything about the God of creation? He does all things for His glory. If it glorifies Him to give you grace, that's a good place to be in. We should should be asking for that grace. The second reason God saves by grace alone is to remove all grounds for human boasting. That's what Paul says here. I'm back in chapter 2 again. He says, by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not of your own doing. It is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. So God wants to remove all grounds for human boasting when it comes to our salvation. So how does he do it? How would you do it if you want to not allow someone any room to brag for how you saved them? What would you do to make sure they have no grounds to brag? You would do it all for them. And then you'd give it to them as a gift. 
So it's not of them. It's all of you. And then you get all the glory for it. Well, that's exactly what he did. He removed all grounds for boasting. And you say, well, what is the gift of God? It says, this is not of your own doing. It is a gift of God. What is this? Is it faith? Is it grace? And I would say it's that and more. It's faith that's a gift. It's grace that's a gift. It's being made alive from the deadness of sin that's a gift. All of salvation is a gift. So that we have no grounds for boasting. So let me say it very, very plainly. Uh, Any theological system that gives any credit to man for their salvation is wrong. Because it leaves grounds for human boasting. And our God will have all glory for how He saved us through His Son. And that's why this matters. And let me end uh, saying something here to our, if I could, try to appeal to our hearts. Um, Because it would be very tragic, guys, if we were to talk about the grace of God tonight and then someone were to leave here and not receive it. That would be really tragic. And, you know, there, it is possible that, that someone leave here and not receive the grace of God. Because there is a, a verse that's repeated multiple times in the Bible that says there are some people who will not receive the grace of God. And it, and it, and it goes like this. God opposes the proud. He doesn't give them grace. But He gives grace to the humble. And that, I hope, lands on you as very good news. If you're a broken person, if you're a sinful person, if you're a person who knows I'm not good enough to save myself, if you're someone who thinks you still have something to bring to the table for your salvation, there's no grace for you. Because you don't think you need it. But if you're someone who says, I just need mercy, I've I messed this thing up a long time ago. I've been given first, second, third, fourth chances. I blew those years ago. That's good news. And listen listen to how Luther said it. He said, uh, God receives none but those who are forsaken, restores health to none but those who are sick, gives sight to none but the blind, life to none but the dead. He has mercy on none but the wretched and gives grace to none but those who are in disgrace. And, you know, I really just don't think a lot of us believe this. I really don't. I don't think, because we, here's what we do. We go, oh, my sin, though. My sin is you don't know what I've done. You know, I keep coming to God with this same confession. I keep having to deal with the same sin month after month, year after year. There's got to be, the grace is gone. And we don't understand that where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. That, that our sin actually has limits, but grace is limitless. We, we don't get that. We think that we can run out of it. We think that if God would say, uh, I'm sorry, I've heard that one too many times. You've asked for forgiveness on that sin too many times. No more grace. That would be as if grace had a limit. But grace is limitless. And our sin has limits, but God's grace does not. There are infinite storehouses of grace in Christ. His grace is infinitely greater than your sin. And you say, no, you don't understand what I've done. You don't understand how long I've done it. No, you don't understand that His grace is greater than your sin. And you say, well, how is that possible? Because His grace is not just something that comes from Him, it is something that is in Him. And and listen listen to, A.W. Pink says it great. He says, grace is a perfection of the divine character of God. A.W. Tozer says something similar. God's grace is a self-existent principle inherent in the divine nature. It's in Him. Sinclair Ferguson said, "Grace isn't a, there isn't a thing called grace that uh, all, all there is is just a person called the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And he was in this interview talking about the Reformation. He says, there is not a thing that Jesus takes from himself and then as it were hands over to me. There is only the Lord Jesus himself. It is not a thing that was crucified to give us a thing called grace. It was the person of the Lord Jesus Christ that was crucified in order that he might give himself to us through his spirit. And, and, and uh, Sinclair Ferguson was talking about this Reformation view of grace that I've been trying to show us that Paul was teaching. And, and Calvin, I, you know, people aren't fair to him. He said things very simply and beautifully. Listen to how he described grace here. He says, grace is Christ clothed in the gospel. He said, grace is the grace of Jesus Christ. So when we say salvation is all of grace, we're saying salvation is all of Christ. When we're saying salvation is by grace, we're saying salvation is by Christ. It is in Him. And I'll I'll end with this passage. John 1.14 says, We have seen His glory, the glory of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. And from His fullness... We have all received what? Grace upon grace. If you have Christ, you have grace. It is in Him. And it doesn't run out. And that's not a shallow, superficial thing that should keep us abusing that grace and living in sin to truly understand Christ and His grace like that is what liberates us from sin and inclines our hearts to want to live for His glory. Amen, church? Let's go to the Lord. Let's ask Him to help us. Father, we, we need grace because we are so prone to forget these things. We so easily turn back on ourselves and trust ourselves. We so easily fall for the lives of sin. And Father, yet we can never run out of the grace that is in Your Son. We just thank You that from His fullness we have received grace upon grace. And so Lord, we pray that You would help us as Your people never forget that. And Lord, we pray also for those in this room who have tried to earn Your grace through their good works, through their church attendance, through their Bible reading, through, through trying to stop doing all the bad things in their life. We pray that they would see that grace is a gift given in Your Son. And Father, we pray that they would receive Your Son by faith. Lord, we love You. We thank You for what You've done. We pray, Father, as we go to the table that we could rejoice exceedingly in that work. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.